Hello, Honorable Ministers, Excellencies, uh, Director General, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be uh, today with you all in a context where we are going to have a chance to understand, to learn a little bit how we can work in energy transition. This is the first edition of the Global High Level Forum on Energy Transition. And I am Teresa Rivera, Deputy Prime Minister of the Government of Spain, a minister for the ecological transition and the demographic challenge. So, including energy in my portfolio. It is a great pleasure for me to open this discussion, this very important forum on probably one of the most relevant issues of our times. I would like to warmly welcome all the participants present with us today and the special, especially to welcome the Director General of IRENA, Francesco La Camera, as well as our guest speakers, Mrs. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and Mr. Ho Shung Lee, Chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I would like to extend a warm welcome to the four Vice Presidents of the 11th Assembly of um, IRENA, Albania, Costa Rica, Ghana, and India, who have helped me along these uh, months in order to facilitate and work together in uh, this agenda. Excellencies, I am pleased that you are able to join us today for this very important meeting. I also would like to welcome other distinguished members of the panel from the European Commission, the ROC Chair from Antigua and Barbuda, the current G20 Presidency from Italy, the incoming G20 Presidency from Indonesia, the incoming G7 Presidency from Germany and the United Arab Emirates. The panel discussion will be moderated by Mrs. Melinda Crane, Chief Political Correspondent from the Deutsche Welle Television. Before I address the forum, let me briefly outline our discussion today. At uh, its 11th session, the Assembly established a new global high-level forum to be hosted on an annual basis with the objective of leveraging ARENA's near universal membership and convening power to center stage energy transitions and put them at the heart of an effective post-COVID recovery. Today, this first edition of the Global High-Level Forum takes place with the public release of the complete editions of IRENA's World Energy Transition Outlook. This year's edition comprises ambitious contents, the 1.5 degree needed to be within reach, and what does this mean for the energy transition scenario, an analysis of socioeconomic impacts of this pathway, and recommendations on policies and financing sources for its achievements. This is a very timely edition of the Global High Level Forum, given the urgency to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and the need to bring CO2 emissions to net zero by 2050 at the latest, while acting on a responsibility to ensure job creation, industrial development and overall welfare for our people. We are witnessing these days this horrible heat wave in the northern of Canada, in the northern of Siberia. This is so anomalous, so strange, that this could be impacting everybody in the world. 49 degrees, 48 degrees at this latitude is more than something unusual. This forum will provide for a high-level discussions on the relation between science and raising climate ambition in light of the ongoing processes and the opportunity for us all to jointly deliver at the level required. We need to accelerate a just, inclusive, and systemic energy transition in support of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. More than that, thinking on our societies, thinking in our children and grandchildren, thinking in the prosperity and the welfare for all. To frame our discussions, we will hear an opening remark by ERINA's Director General, as well as remarks from our keynote speakers. And this will then be followed by a panel discussion. I would also like to inform to you that in the interest of enhancing transparency and inclusiveness, the forum will be live streamed across ERINA's communication channels so that anyone willing to follow our discussions is able to do so. 
to do so. Thank you so much for being here today, for being committed to energy transition and for all your efforts. Dear Francesco, the floor is yours. Madam President of the Assembly, Madam Teresa Rivera, Mr. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary of the UNFCC, Mr. Hauser Ling, Chair of the IPPC, distinguished members of the high level panel, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my true pleasure to welcome you all to this global high level forum on energy transition. I'd like to express my appreciation to the Deputy Prime Minister Rivera Teresa for her remarks. It's a testimony to the importance of the energy transition as a desire for international cooperation that ARENA members established the high level forum. And while none of us wished for our first meeting of the forum to be convened virtually, and in this limited format, we are here today, as we all understand, timing is of the essence. The significance of the choice we make in the coming year is clear. We must make the right ones. There is no room for error. Our first world energy transition outlook has been developed with this in mind. It is rooted in the sense of urgency to act on climate change, but resolute in, ch in charting a path toward a resilient and more equitable world. In March of this year, we released a, a preview of this outlook, showing how the energy system must change to align with the one point degree trajectory. As you can see uh, on this slide, ARENA considers electrification and energy efficiency to be the main decarbonization drivers, enabled by renewables, green hydrogen, and sustainable biomass. And these technologies can shape the avenue to lead us out of the crisis towards a decarbonized energy system. Since ARENA's inception, our member have asked that we are that we be the global voice of renewables. And I have to say that uh, today I've been informed that another country has uh, uh, reached ARENA. So we are now 166 members. 10 years later, we can see that our choice has been heard loud and clear. ARENA vision of the energy future, future is today mainstream. We renewables routinely at the center of climate and development strategies. Now is time to take it to the next level. The world energy transition outlook set the stage for this step change, but several prerequisites frame its conclusions. We have captured them in the guiding framework of the veto theory of change. This outlook prioritize a path that is most likely to rapidly reduce emission in the coming decade and set the trajectory for developing, developing the most promising technologies. It provides a timeline and clarity on the steps to be taken to manage transition from fossil fuels. And it shows that success will only be possible if the process is inclusive from the engagement of citizens at local level to ensure that all countries of the world have an opportunity to keep pace with and benefit from the transition. Investment and policy choice in the coming decade will define whether we'll be able to do so. As you can see, we estimate that 131 US, US dollars, trillion dollars will be needed to realize the pathway with the peak in the outlook. This is a 33 trillion more than what current strategy and plans in place envisage. But it is not an additional cost, as you can see on uh, this slide. Arena's analysis shows that when the reduced externality from lower air pollution 
and avoid climate change are combined, the overall benefit of the energy transition is valid between $2 to $5.5 saved for every additional US dollar spent. But we have to be very clear, the task ahead is difficult and we are entering an uncharted territory. And uh, you are acutely aware of the complexity of the transition uh, you deal with every day. It is evident that energy transition can no longer be made in a vacuum of limited to technologies choices. They need to be reconciled with economics and human development goals, environment concern and financial avenues. They need a comprehensive policy framework that consider people, prosperity and planet as uh, illustrated in this light. And this is the context that ARENA bring is unique value. We have uh, the privilege to work with country from all corner of the world and gain insight across a gamut of transition issues. The outlook bring this knowledge and experience together and offer a fresh perspective on how we embark on 1.5 degree path. It presents the policy framework necessary to advance a transition that is just inclusive. So not just a models, but also policies and provide an improved understanding of structural, structural change that will occur. Here we offer a quantitative framework for impacts such as GDP, employment and welfare, building on a decade long body of knowledge. We see the benefits we we'll realize even in the short term. By 2030, the 1.5 Celsius pathway will boost the global GDP of 2.5% above the current plans, uh, plans and strategy and show as a show here in this, uh, in this slide. This means at this moment, we, when many countries are looking for the way out of an economic downturn, investment in the energy transition can bring much needed growth. The outlook also showed that following the 1.5 degree pathway will more than double the employment in the energy sector from 58 million in 2019 to 122 million in 2050. And these slides show that renewable energy alone will grow fourfold from 11.5 million in 2019 to 43 million in 2050. And then we had to add to, to these all other jobs in energy efficiency or in the building or infrastructure. And this offering diverse opportunities for those who may need to transition to different occupation. But we also know that these are not just numbers. They represent workers, families, and communities. So we caution not to oversimplify, but carefully and proactively manage possible misalignments, be it in timelines, skills, or geographies, geographies. And we show many opportunities that exist along the renewable value chain to provide insight that are practical and that real life application. It is now be essential to a more nuanced, and increasing granular approach to the energy transition. It is for that reason that ARENA has introduced the first energy transition welfare index shown on this slide to provide an empirical basis to help policymakers understand different dimensions of the transition and reap the full benefits of the energy transition itself. For the first time, we also report on distributional and energy sex dimensions that are often overlooked in energy transition analysis. So, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today we see a renewed commitment to an energy transition 
and a growing recognition of its wide impact on economies, economies and societies. The community of countries striving for a net zero energy future is growing, but progress remains uneven across countries and regions. And the energy transition trend indicates that large part of the world, including the most vulnerable countries, still are not moving at a necessary pace. We cannot longer afford to overlook widening gaps and growing inequalities. Energy plays a vital role in changing this situation. Arena World Energy Transition Outlooks provides the technology, policies, and investment element for a different energy future. We will translate this global vision into regional outlook and framework for investment, not only show what is possible, but also help to realize the optimal outcome. This is the time to be decisive, uncompromising, and courageous. The energy transition is an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. ARENA, as a prime platform for international cooperation, will assertively lead the global energy transition toward a more resilient, inclusive, and equitable world. It is my hope that this world energy transition outlook will help us navigate the road ahead. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, President. Thank you so much, Francesco. I think that it has been a very interesting introductory um, speech. So to allow us to learn a little bit uh, more um, about your work, your assessments, and your recommendations for the time to come in such a critical moment. And we all know about your commitment and the engagement of IRENA with uh, the many uh, different aspects of energy transition, including, for instance, something that I would like to stress and to thank in particular terms, this initiative to facilitate this global health and energy platform of action so that uh, you can contribute, we can all contribute to uh, develop energy facilities in health facilities in Africa. But this is just an example, an example in a very difficult moment where the global society is suffering because of the pandemics and we are coming back to identify our priorities, our main concerns, how, how the different pieces of the complex uh, a reality touches and how they relate each other, how we can work together. These are some of the milestones that you have also stressed underlined in your presentation, how technology, social, economic aspects, they relate to each other. The analysis and the key role of um, IRENA as a global voice uh, on the renewable energy and, uh, global work is very important and it is growing year after year. The agency is strengthening synergies between all the different aspects, of course, starting by climate, how it relates to the climate action and why it is important to succeed in the energy transition. I think that this is part of um, the main message of uh, your report, the energy transition outlook and the highlights, the key recommendations you have introduced. Even um, this very rich uh, knowledge, experience, and foresight approach of IRENA, I think that um, it is time to think a little bit deeply and to share a little bit uh, broader how each of us are facing, we are facing, we all are facing these challenges in a moment where we are also considering, taking into consideration what we want to build and how we want to recover. This is why I think that uh, the fair transition, the just transition, the energy transition and social related aspects are so important. Our collective achievements, even during last year, um, show to what extent we can work and accelerate transformations um, in a fair manner, but also allow us to learn where we need to improve to provide the right answer. Today, we find ourselves in a perfect moment to change things. And uh, the societies are asking for this transformation. So I think that uh, in this uh, regard, the Global High Level Forum on Energy Transition is a very important medium to help us to channel our collective efforts and chart our course 
towards a bright future for our people, for our societies, for our children and grandchildren, a sustainable, climate safe, and full of promise for each of us. This is why it is my great pleasure to allow to ask you to follow the um, comments being made by uh, the United Nations Framework for the Climate Change uh, um, Convention Secretary, uh, Patricia Espinosa, who is sending us, who is sharing with us some of very important key policy messages in the time to come. Please let us uh, pay attention to her messages. I am pleased to join you for today's important exchange of views. I would be remiss if I did not first acknowledge Irina's continuing leadership in facilitating global discussions on how best to promote energy transitions that are green, fair, and equitable. They do so not just through meetings like this, but also through its invaluable publications. The Global Renewables Outlook published last April offered us clear insight and options for nations to consider going forward, particularly in regard to the importance of more ambitious NDCs. And now, with the release of the Energy Transitions Outlook, we are offered a nuanced vision of a new energy landscape, a vision that aligns with the Paris Agreement, a vision that sees the possibility of limiting global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees and bringing CO2 emissions closer to net zero by mid-century. But be, we must be clear here with the energy sector being the source of three quarters of greenhouse gas emissions, we need a rapid and comprehensive transformation of how we produce, transport, and consume energy. It is equally clear that energy and energy transition strategies may very well define our ultimate success or failure in reaching our climate goals. Coming up with the right mix to the equation will no doubt be challenging. After all, how do we balance the imperative of global transitioning to green energy, but doing so in a manner that protects the social and economic needs of those most impacted by these transitions? As this latest report notes, proven technologies for a net zero energy system already largely exist today. Renewables are now the cheapest option to produce electricity in several parts of the world. But their deployment needs to accelerate to steer the world towards reaching its international climate goals aligned with the Paris Agreement. For these technologies to be fully utilized, however, investment now needs to be ramped up significantly. While the good news is that financial markets and investors are beginning to see the value in clean energy, we must advance rapidly beyond a beginning. And of course, this cannot be just a matter of private sector investment. As the world leaves COVID behind, there will be a wave of investments and spending to support rapid economic recovery. These investments must be aligned with the net zero pathway. To that end, governments must lead the way in planning and promoting the required massive energy infrastructure investment, including in matters of transmission and distribution. Government leadership on clean energy must also be reflected in its climate change commitments, particularly as expressed in their nationally determined contributions. Here, the news is decidedly mixed. Even though renewable energy generation is the most frequently communicated mitigation measure in the NDCs, only a handful of countries have included quantitative targets for the share of renewables in the electricity mix consistent with a 1.5 degree pathway. 
Indeed, most pledges are not yet underpinned by near-term policies and measures. Moreover, even if successfully fulfilled, the pledges to date would still leave over 20 billion tons of CO2 emissions worldwide in 2050. A continuation of that trend would have extremely negative repercussions for the planet. We clearly have a long way to go and time is short. From a UN climate change perspective, governments must significantly and immediately boost their climate change ambition and be accountable for meeting their pledges, including financial ones. Nowhere is this more important than decisions and actions taken on clean energy. The discussions and exchanges today are a vital part of that process, and I am confident the issues raised may well inform the debate at the Secretary General's high-level dialogue on energy in September, and, of course, at COP26 in Glasgow this coming November. Let me close by reaffirming how highly I value IRENA and its stakeholder allies for their work and ongoing commitment to a greener world for our children and grandchildren. I regard ours as a fundamental partnership on the road to fulfilling the vision of Paris and beyond. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your comments. Uh, I think that uh, this is a, a very appropriate moment to congratulate um, your synergies, uh, Irina and UNFCCC, um, on the findings, uh, findings and recommendations you uh, stress uh, together. All of them aligned with the IPCC special report on global warming and how to uh, um, ensure that 1.5 uh, goal is within reach. Uh, how we can facilitate the Paris Agreement's uh, objectives and how we can build uh, on sustainable development goals. I think that um, Mrs. Espinosa has stressed some of the most important remarks. Uh, we need to think about the COP26, which is approaching. We need to um, raise the level of expectations and the level of uh, deliveries, how we can ensure proper delivery properly aligned with um, the need and with the facts that we are witnessing every day. An increased ambition on 2030 emissions is one of the milestones we should be working on. Many countries have done so. The reduction targets being aligned to a much more uh, um, ambitious perspective is being communicated to the UNFCCC during the last months. And uh, the way we need to accelerate the phase out of coal, the consistency in the mobilized uh, fin finance, both in terms of quantity, but also quality, and how the investments uh, should be taking into consideration the need not to increase uh, the level of uh, concern, the level of danger uh, to take into consideration instead. The climate emergency we are facing is absolutely key. This is why I think it is very important uh, and a very positive thing to count on Mr. Housen Lee to deliver um, a keynote a speech, some keynote remarks on why, how, and what are the findings of the IPCC. Mr. Lee, you have the floor. Thank you, Minister, and Excellencies and colleagues. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, global high-level forum on energy transition, uh, which is the occasion to release the complete edition of the World Energy Transition Outlook. I was very pleased to hear that uh, this outlook presents an energy pathway along with, aligned with the findings of the IPCC Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which was released in uh, 2018. As a policy neutral body, the IPCC supports that policy should be based on science. So thank you for your contribution to this. In just over a month, uh, we will release the latest scientific understanding of the physical science basis of climate change. Uh, following this, 
the latest assessments on climate risks, vulnerability, adaptation, and mitigation responses will be available six months after the release of this physical science basis of climate change. This will update our knowledge underlining the ambition needed to reach a 1.5 degree pathway. But already our special report on 1.5 degrees of less than three years ago provides a firm foundation for policy action. It tells us that pathways limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees would require rapid and far-reaching transitions in energy, land use, transport, built environment, and industrial systems. Many countries have announced net zero goals. Efforts toward lower emissions are already underway in many countries, regions, cities, and businesses. We need to see a rapid escalation in the current scale and pace of change, particularly in the coming decades. Shifting to low or zero emission power generation, electrifying end use energy demand, changing food systems to achieve low carbon footprint, green infrastructure, and improving efficiency in energy and materials use, are the menus of transition. The, unlike the menu you see in the restaurant, you are not to pick and choose of your favorite items. In this transition menu, you are to take everything in the menu, although the proportion of each item taken would differ according to your capacity and preference. This is to achieve transition in the most cost-effective way. The deployment of low emission technology depends on economic conditions, of course, such as employment generation and investment mobilization, depend on also on social and cu cultural conditions, awareness and acceptability, and institutional conditions, such as political support. Looking in more detail of at more detail that renewables, we see that in the 1.5 degree pathways with no or no li or limited overshoot, low emission energy sources are projected to have 70 to 85% of electricity in 2050, obviously a higher share compared with pathways to two degrees or more. There are many challenges and national circumstances will affect the choice of options but the political, economic, social, and technical feasibility of solar energy and wind energy and electricity storage technologies have substantially improved over the past few years. These improvements signal potential system transition in electricity generation. This also signals a tremendous investment opportunity for new technologies. Annual investments in low carbon energy technologies and energy efficiency are expected to be upscaled by roughly a factor of six by 2050 compared with 2015. This transition is inseparable from adaptation to global warming and this supports sustainable development. Reducing the climate change related vulnerability of human and natural systems is at the core of sustainable development. This requires more investment in physical and social infrastructure to generate enabling conditions to enhance the resilience and adaptive capacities of societies. The benefits of this investment can occur in most regions with adaptation to warming of 1.5 degrees. Let me close with some general considerations. All of us, you and me, contribute to global warming through emissions resulting from every one of our daily actions. By changing our behavior and choices in what we eat, how we move around cities and between countries, how we heat and cool our homes, we can make a difference. Cumulatively, 
we can make a big difference. But this individual choice is subject to availability and access to green infrastructure. Committed emissions from existing infrastructure threaten to exhaust in a very short period of time the remaining carbon budget for 1.5 degrees. This is why we need to have green infrastructure as fast as possible. Individual, life, individual lifestyle choice is a subset of national choice of infrastructure and technology, which defines the character of net zero transition. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lee, for your remarks. I think that um, we are all aware of um, the dramatic uh, data that uh, science uh, and observation provide. Science is unequivocal about uh, the way to counter the consequences of climate change, which expand all economic, social and environmental dimensions. And science also stresses the importance of uh, dealing with the time dimension, so to facilitate this transformation uh, to happen as soon as possible, but pay much attention to the social dimensions. We need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. We need to facilitate prosperity and development for those uh, that have not had an opportunity to reach um, development and prosperity and i think that we all need to work together to facilitate this transformation this is why i look forward to hearing your very diverse perspectives on our collective endeavor and to understand better how we can work how we can further leverage the global high level forum on energy transition to catalyze a decisive shift towards a decarbonized energy future the discussion among our um, friends, among our high-level panelists, will be moderated by Mrs. Melinda Crane. Melinda, hello, good afternoon, good morning. After the discussion, I will invite the Director General to share some final reflections. But for the time being, let me hand over to Mrs. Crane. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Excellency Teresa Ribera, and many thanks also to Francesco La Camera. Hello, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome from me as well to this high level moderated panel. I'm Melinda Crane, and it is an honor to accompany you as moderator. And let me also greet our live stream audience because this panel and our event are, in fact, being live streamed across all of Irina's social media channels. So it's great to have that. That live stream audience with us as well. We meet today to achieve a single crucial mission to accelerate the deployment of clean energy around the world. We've just heard those very urgent messages from Patricia Espinoza and also from Ho Sung Lee. And in fact, this first special edition of the Global High Level Forum builds on the urgency that you yourselves conveyed, Excellencies, during the 11th IRENA Assembly. The world energy transition outlook couldn't be clearer, as Francesco La Camera has been saying. We are not where we need to be. We can and must up our game. So more now than ever, as we look toward COP26, we want to showcase in this discussion clean energy leadership and also identify future priorities for catalyzing transformative action. And in particular, we want to try to pick up on some of WIDO's key messages, messages that, as we heard, are fundamentally optimistic. There is a realistic pathway to get us where we need to go. And that pathway, and I think this is one of the truly groundbreaking aspects of the study, that pathway can deliver major economic and societal benefits. So how do we leverage the political will and the initiative needed? That, in essence, is our key question in this discussion, and we have an outstanding panel to answer it. I'm going to keep the introductions very brief to maximize our time. It is an honor to welcome the European Union's Commissioner for Energy, Her Excellency Kadri Simpson. Also with us are the Vice Presidents of the 11th session of the IRENA Assembly, Deputy Minister of Infrastructure and Energy of Albania, Mr. Gergi Simaku, Minister of Energy of Ghana, Matthew Opoku Prempe, 
Mr. Indu Shekhar Chaturvedi, Secretary and Vice Minister for New and Renewable Energy for India, and the Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica, Her Excellency Andrea Meza, is also with us. Speaking on behalf of the Alliance of Small Island States, Antigua and Barbuda, we're going to be hearing from His Excellency Conrad Hunte. Speaking for the current G20 presidency and joining us a little bit later is Italy's Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Manlio Di Stefano. And speaking for the G20 presidency, 2022, we will hear from Indonesia's Minister for Energy and Mineral Resources, Arifin Tasrif. Also here, uh, or joining us a bit later, is the, and speaking for the G7 presidency of 2022, is the Director General of Energy Policy at Germany's Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, Torsten Hadden. And we'll hear from the United Arab Emirates Minister of Climate Change and Environment, His Excellency Abdullah bin Mohammed Belhaif al Nuaimi. So that is quite a roster uh, to pick up on some very important issues. And I want to ask our panel to get us started by sharing your perspectives on two issues. And they're also, again, based on the WITO uh, that we have just heard about from Francesco. What concrete action is your country, region, or organization taking to accelerate the energy transformation in the short term? And giving WITO's emphasis on the need for holistic policy frameworks that foster a just transition, yeah. I'd like to ask all of you to please tell us what you're doing to ensure that no one is left behind in the transition to clean energy. And I'm going to ask all of you to please keep your remarks in this first round of discussion to under four minutes. I know it's tough, but we are in a tight schedule and I wanna make sure that we have time for interaction after this first round. So that would give us time for follow-up questions. Thank you so much. And I'll go first to the EU, which in the midst of the pandemic and the economic downturn, managed to agree on adopting significantly more ambitious climate targets as part of the Green New Deal. So perhaps you can say a word, Commissioner, about how to keep the long-term perspective in view, even when you're facing a short-term challenge as policymaker. Yes, of course. And uh, thank you, Melinda, and dear Teresa, dear Francesco, dear colleagues, greetings from Brussels. Uh, first, um, I want to thank you for convening this high-level forum and for all the work that has uh, gone into the World Energy Transition Outlook. Um, the outlook is both a, a reminder of the cha challenge ahead of us and, uh, and a tool to overcome it. Um, in Paris, we agreed collectively on climate targets based on science, and uh, these targets imply a full and um, fast transformation of the global energy system. And the years uh, since Paris uh, have shown us um, two things. First, this transformation is already happening. And second, it is not happening fast enough. Uh, so the central question we need to answer is uh, how fast uh, can we phase out fossil fuels? And how fast can we scale up renew renewables? And if we look at electricity, the answer is very fast. Uh, last year, we saw a significant drop in global energy use. And despite that, renewable energy installations have not only increased during the pandemic, they exceeded even the boldest uh, predictions. And virtually all new power capacity worldwide comes from renewables. A country that still plans fossil investments with a long life cycle, such as uh, coal, is looking into expensive standard assets. However, the full picture is um, that today, renewable energy still meets just over 11% of global final energy demand. Uh, inefficient, carbon-heavy and polluting power plants are being replaced, but not quickly enough. Uh, in the sectors like heating and cooling or transport, renewable shares are very low, and energy efficiency is also not improving fast enough, and global energy demand um, keeps growing. And uh, we need to find a way to trigger the same speed of change in those sectors as we have seen in power generation and uh, transform our energy systems. Uh, this is the message that uh, the World Energy Transi uh, Transition Outlook and also the objective of the European Green Deal uh, gives us. So the EU has made um, climate neutrality by 2050 
our absolute priority. The first milestone is 2030 and a 55% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by then. And this requires um, doubling our share of renewables within 10 years. And to be up to the challenge, uh, we are currently reviewing the whole EU legislation to make sure that it is aligned with our ambition. And we are also working with the 27 member states to ensure that uh, the national recovery packages will direct unprecedented public funds into the green transition. The Green Deal is also guiding our international engagement uh, for the global energy transition. To be successful, we need to ensure that we leave no one behind. And this means first financial support. The EU and uh, our member states are the world's biggest providers of climate finance. And we will keep this lead with our new European financing tool, Global Europe. And second, uh, sharing our experience and supporting regional approaches um, in Eastern Europe, uh, in Africa and elsewhere. And third, accelerating the transition, be it from coal or from environmentally harmful fossil fuel subsidies and managing the change. And we stand by IRENA and by the COP26 presidency in uh, their efforts to build constructive dialogue about the global energy transition and want to make COP26 a, a turning point, the point where we steer our trajectory firmly towards Paris targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, for your remarks. Also picking up uh, on what we heard earlier about the crucial importance of adequate investment flows also into infrastructure. So thank you very much for that. Let's go now to the Vice Presidents of the 11th IRENA Assembly. And I'll begin with Deputy Minister Simaku. And uh, Albania, in fact, is one of Europe's main producers of renewable electricity. So uh, please, when you talk about a bit about the transformative actions that you're taking, perhaps you can say a word about the most important legislative and institutional levels for boosting the share of renewables even further uh, within the total energy mix? Uh, dear Mrs. Mrs. Khan, I'm uh, honorable to take part in this uh, uh, forum for uh, energy transition. Albania is a case that, as you said, uh, a good example in, in the region for its renewable. So, honorable uh, ministers, excellencies, general director, uh, EU commissioner, Ms. Simpson, ladies and gentlemen, and I would like again to thank you for taking opportunity for Albania to, to be part of this uh, high level forum for energy transition. In fact, Albania is not the case for energy transition uh, in the manner that uh, you are talking about, to phase out carbon fuels uh, for energy production. Albania is a case that 100% of the electricity produced is produced by hydropower, by the renewables. And government of Albania recognize the key role of energy sector for the economic development of the country. Albania is therefore giving new impetus to energy uh, uh, reforms while also consolidating existing efforts to both provide enabling conditions for renewable energy development and comply with its uh, regional uh, international commitments. In uh, this sense, uh, as far as Albania is a uh, hundred percent a renewable producer gener on generation, uh, Albania is uh, facing to, uh, to a, a very uh, large, uh, large reform for establishing energy security, energy sector sustainability, and ensure energy supply and cost-effective prices, which are therefore some key challenges, challenges for the country to address in the near term. So, uh, on these challenges, uh, we can meet by further increasing the share of the renewable in the national mix and diversify the country, the country's energy sector uh, generation 
generation of electricity and doing that full with uh, uh, renewables. In that sense, uh, Albania is uh, developing and uh, is the first country in, uh, in Balkan that organized two auction, two very successful auction uh, during the 2020 and uh, uh, the latest one is was in March of uh, 21 that uh, uh, we have found a very low price for 70 megawatt of installation to have a price for 15 less than 25 euro per megawatt hour this is a, a, a very good achievement and also the second round of the the new auction scheme for the support it was around 30 euro per megawatt hour so with two uh, to this kind of development we have shown that uh, uh, renewables under auction works is functionable and achievable so we are moving on the legal framework to to uh, to remove from our legislation the feed-in tariffs and to leave the uh, the market uh, working so uh, in our vision is that uh, we have to be involved also in the process of creating supportive domestic energy market ensuring the energy security energy efficiency environmental protection and uh, on GAG emissions even with a small contribution in the Balkan as far as we have no any uh, fossil fuel generation unit on, on that sense we are working hard uh, for the very last uh, let's say action plan which is NSCP national energy and climate plan the Albania is the first country that opened this let's say uh, this game in, in, in the region, in Western, in uh, WB6. And also we are working hard for decarbonizing the uh, transport sector. The transport uh, uh, CO2 share is uh, very high to us. It's the only uh, contributor on CO2 emissions. And we have to fight it. There are many, many challenges inside like uh, you know in the transport sector albania is not a country that produce cars but we have to protect ourselves from the used car from the western as far in western country like in germany france and other country there are many cars used one to be uh, to be working on 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 our region and we have to 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 to, to be careful about it so uh, instead of that we have to uh, harmonize the low carbon economy roadmap and to uh, to share as much as we can and to uh, support as much as we can the low carbon uh, uh, emission in transport sector so recently albanian government and albanian parliament has started a new project for tirana for sustainable transport in Tirana with KFW for 50 uh, million euro in order to decarbonize uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the public transport. Mm -hmm. This is a very good uh, approach for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, we are not the only one in the, in the region working. We are in a full collaboration for opening market in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Balkan. Thank so you so the much, Deputy Minister. We're actually going to come back to collaboration a little bit later in our second round. Okay, so fine. if you don't mind, I'll ask you to, uh, to wind up your first round remarks there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I will go now to Minister Prempe. Please, you have the, the floor. Minister Prempe? I have wanted to serve as one of the vice chairs of the 11th session of IRENA Assembly. Yes, indeed. I, said, I, I did introduce you a little bit earlier, uh, formally, so thank you for uh, reminding us. Thank you so much. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, at the continental and regional levels, the Africa Union Energy Ministers Conference in 2011 called for rapidly increasing access to modern clean energy sources 
increased regional power supply, and securing finance and capacity for large-scale projects as a measure to address climate change threats, reverse developmental gains. Since then, we have been working towards the development of regional and national sustainable energy access roadmaps to address mitigation, adaptation, regional interconnectivity, the scaling up of renewables, energy efficiency, and financing possibilities for sustainable options for increasing clean energy access in Africa. In Ghana, government is pursuing policies to scale up renewable energy penetration by 10% and increase energy efficiency of thermal generation plants by 20% by 2030. And I'm glad to inform you that we are on track to achieving them. It is our responsible contribution to the broader ecosystem ambitions, including the Paris Agreement of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. We would continue to push the implementation of both the conditional and unconditional commitments under the primary Paris Agreement to achieve the targets. Our actions include increasing installed capacity of small to medium scale hydropower by 150 to 300 megawatts and solar installed capacity to nearly 1,000 megawatts by 2030. We are creating the right market conditions to enable the full participation of private sector in the delivery of our energy transition goals. In 2020, the Parliament of Ghana amended the Renewable Energy Act to make it relevant to the needs of our time. To ensure that we are committed to our renewable energy portfolio standards, we have completed a comprehensive national renewable energy master plan with a comprehensive strategy for implementation. As the Minister and a Member of Parliament, I will ensure that the country's renewable energy master plan is given the legal teeth and implemented to the letter. Ghana and Africa, for that matter, should be committed to developing and ensuring a reliable, high quality energy service sector to propel the transformation and industrialization at the end of the continent through the formulation, implementation, monetary evaluation of our smart energy policies. Within the context of our energy sector vision, our goal should be geared towards making energy. Based load power in an environmentally friendly and cost efficient manner to accelerate the national, regional, and continental agenda. As a, as a continent, as a continent or a country endowed with a lot of uh, energy resources, I think we would be the technology and the resources to make our transition in this energy uh, era a success. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency for those remarks. And staying with the Vice Presidents of the 11th IRENA Assembly, let me go now to Vice Minister Chaturvedi. And India too is reaching high in terms of renewables with the aim of getting- Hydrogen. Shukran Lek. Sahwat al Mal Sayyida Rivera. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So, our energy landscape has totally transformed in the last few years, and we have we have worked on all, all aspects. Sayyida Rivera. Rivera. Energy efficiency, expanding energy access, increasing the. Sayyida Rivera. Uh, renewable energy in our total energy mix. Uh, what is really important to note is that we are the only country whose actions are compliant, only major country, major economy whose actions are compliant with the 2%, uh, two, 2 degrees uh, rise in temperature. So in the last six years, our renewable energy capacity has, has gone up 2.5 times. It now stands at about 141 gigawatt if you include large hydro. Our solar energy capacity has gone up by around 16 times in the, in the same period. We are the fourth largest in our RE capacities. Notwithstanding these achievements, we recognize that our targets are very ambitious, 450 gigawatt going forward. And uh, here I would also like to mention uh, something which, which we have been saying on these fora. Uh, we are a little disappointed that other countries, other major countries, major economies have not done as much as they were expected to do. So going forward, our targets are very, very ambitious. 450 gigawatt is a major challenge. And we do recognize that, that uh, 
this will require a set this will require actions across a range of areas and we are confident that we will be able to take those actions and achieve our targets uh, we now are working on a very major scheme to to provide decentralized uh are solutions and also to to solarize our agriculture sector the scheme basically pertains to to solarizing whole agriculture feeders so that all pumps connected to that feeder are solarized and the, our plans have the potential to to solarize about 5 million uh, pumps of total capacity of about 27 gigawatt uh, we have our solar rooftop program our energy efficiency program but i i don't want to go into those details uh, uh, one specific thing which you which you mentioned was about our hydrogen plants so our hydrogen plants we we have already started working on a hydrogen mission which our prime minister announced uh, a few months back and our hope is to to set in place uh, all actions that are that are a part of uh, part of that hydrogen mission and to start implementing them in particular we we want to create demand so that green hydrogen production uh, gets scaled up quickly and the costs come down and that we plan to do by introducing mandatory obligations uh, on certain industries uh, where they would be required to to source a certain certain quantity of the total hydrogen requirements from green hydrogen uh, we we do recognize that international collaboration is an important uh, aspect of the global energy transition we have bilateral bilateral part partnership with a number of countries those partnerships have been very very productive and we have contributed in in a major way to a multilateral effort and that is the isa we do hope that going forward other countries will will contribute handsomely to the isa so that it can do what it is expected to do thank you uh, thank you so much Thank you very much, uh, Vice Minister. And in fact, we will, as I say, take a deeper dive on collaboration in our second round uh, of discussion uh, in a little while. But let me stay now uh, again with the Vice Presidents of the 11th IRENA Assembly and come to Minister Meza. And uh, Costa Rica's National Energy Plan goal is to achieve and maintain a 100% renewable energy matrix by 2030. An impressive target, indeed. So I wonder if you could say just a word about how you're progressing on that, where the challenges lie, and in that context, uh, perhaps also address uh, the second of our key questions in regard to the just transition, because the harsh toll that the pandemic has taken on your economy surely doesn't make this journey any easier. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, and, and um, kind uh, salutation to my friend Teresa and my friend Francesco and to all the excellencies here, and, and thank you for the invitation to this panel. And um, yes, we have been achieving this high share of renewables in the electricity matrix, but we're still uh, far behind when we see the whole energy matrix. And, and I think that the big challenge right now is how to uh, advance in electrifying the transport sector, how to advance in the electrification of the industrial sector. And, and this is a little bit the reflection right now with the pandemic and with the small fiscal space, we need to uh, be a very, uh, to have a lot of innovation in the financial mechanisms and to be very uh, um, wise to prioritize what are the, the investments that will maintain us aligned to the 1.5. And in this regard, I really welcome the outlook. I think it's, it's a great uh, document. It, it is showing us a lot of good information and elements. And, and I think that this coherence in, in policies is a critical element. And just to, and just to uh, move to the elements around also just transition um, and the work that we're doing, not only in Costa Rica, but also in the Central American region, which I think it's also very critical. And IRENA is, is doing a very interesting job here. We have an MOU signed with IRENA, with the SICA, the integration system. 
And right now we're working in this renewable or roadmap uh, to implement renewables. And, and I think that this is the kind of work that we need to continue implementing uh, to have support for policy making at the regional level, at the national level. Um, there is also another good experience and, and it was this alliance between IRENA and the NDC partnership and this facilitated that a lot of countries included as specific targets in their enhanced NDCs. And I think that now that we have these enhanced NDCs with concrete and specific uh, energy targets and uh, what our effort is, how can we contribute now in their implementation? So we have long-term strategies, we have NDCs, we have the whole policies in, in the different countries. And now that we need to accelerate action it is a, a critical um, momentum to mobilize resources for the implementation of these policies. And in regard to just transition, I will say that uh, we still need to elaborate more how can we address these just transition components. I think there, there is a good experiences coming from Spain. I think that IRENA has just made a very good analysis here. So the idea is how can we bring these experiences to the local and regional um, context? And I think that we have the opportunity to work on those areas uh, in terms of, of just transition, because we know that we need to, there will be uh, sectors that, uh, that we need to address with this social component, but it's, we need practical advice on how to do these dialogues, on how to really um, then establish concrete measures so we can uh, address these equity components as well. And, and in the region, it is not also to talk about uh, the whole uh, electrification of the different uses, but also is to talk about energy poverty. And this is the other critical component that we also need to address. And I think that uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but um, I just would like to congratulate that we are having this high level dialogue, that we have these uh, specific tools. And I will encourage to continue working with these regional approaches to also continue working with these alliances. I think it's the way that we can mobilize resources in a, in a more uh, integrated manner and to continue with this systemic approach. And I will leave it here um, in this first intervention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you, uh, Minister Meza. And let me pick up uh, on uh, the final points that you made with Mr. Hunter speaking for uh, Iosis and uh, Antigua Barbuda. And uh, let me ask you to include in your remarks as well, if you would, a few thoughts about how you balance competing social, economic, and environmental priorities. Thank you, Melinda, and first let me say thank you to Francisco for having us here as EOSIS. Certainly, we welcome this initiative of the Global High Level Forum on Energy Transition. Uh, one of the things I must preface my intervention with, Melinda, is the fact that as small island developing states, we have set very ambitious NDCs, and we are fully committed to them, even back from COP21 in Paris, and we continue to improve upon them. But of course, as small island developing state, it is a challenge for us to develop, given our small size, remoteness, and it's always even more expensive. So, for example, maybe if I cite a, for example, an island like my own, which is Antigua and Barbuda, of course, we've just had the COVID pandemic, and we have also set off on a number of ambitious targets, actually, and renewable energy projects. But how do we balance this? Do we, in essence, stop these projects to look after our society? Do we, in turn, look about preparing for hurricanes or looking for hospital needs? It is a very complex, especially when your economy that is driven by tourism, for us, in the last 18 months, 
tourism have dried up. So how do we actually try to balance our economic growth, our environment initiatives to look after our planet? Do we do a break on the fishing and uh, uh, time, time, time span? Do we have certain times where you can do fishing, but there isn't any income coming in now? Do we override these rules? So it's a delicate balance. And our prime minister had to virtually try and think of ways, more innovative ways, to try and see how we can actually accomplish this, given the fact that we are small economy, we have no alternate source of revenue. So, of course, what is needed is partnership and some relief from our global partners in terms of debt relief, so we can, in essence, exercise some of the flexibility and meet some of the priorities to balance our economic, our environment, and social needs. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hunta. And we go now to Minister Tazrif. And given that Indonesia has adopted an ambitious transition strategy, including no new coal, we asked him to tell us about the strategies and measures that his government is prioritizing going forward. Assembly, His Excellency Teresa Ribera, Director General Irena, Excellency Francesco La Camera, Executive Secretary UNFCCC, Patricia Espinosa, Chairman of IPCC, Mr. Lee, distinguished panelists, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. My warmest congratulations to Irena for the first edition of the Global High Level Forum on energy transition and also the launching of IRENA's World Energy Transitions Outlook. I do sincerely hope that this report can serve as a comprehensive reference for countries in achieving energy transition targets. Indonesia has an enormous potential of more than 400 gigawatt of renewable energy with the largest potential resource as solar, hydro, wind, bioenergy, geothermal, and ocean. Renewable energy plays an important role, not only in combating climate change, but also in implementing the energy transition to a more sustainable future. The Indonesian government has set a renewable energy target of 20% by 2025 and more renewable by 2050. As for now, the share of renewable energy has reached around 11.2% of total energy mix. Renewable energy also becomes one of the main contributors from the energy sector for the realization of Indonesia's nationally determined contribution. By last year, our NDC has reached more than 64 million tons of CO2 emission and determined to achieve around more than 300 million tons CO2 emission greenhouse gas emission by 2030. To assure a just, inclusive and systemic energy transition in the country, the Indonesian government has launched a set of policy strategies as follows. Massive new and renewable developments with additional capacity around 38 gigawatt by 2035, prioritizing on solar PV. Besides that, we will also continue to develop other new and renewable energy sources, such as wind, biomass, and others. Reduction of fossil energy resources utilization and clean technology implementation through no additional coal power plant unless it is already having power purchase agreement contract or under construction stage. Converting the use of diesel fuel into gas power plant with a total capacity of more than two gigawatt, then gradually transforming to renewables power plant afterwards. Phasing out of coal power plants and coal gas power plants and implementation of carbon capture storage or carbon capture utilization and storage for fossil power plants. Interconnection of transmission and smart grid electricity development. For the development of electricity infrastructure, our target is to interconnect electricity transmission in Sumatra, Java, Kalimantan, and Sulawesi by 2024, as well as several inter-island interconnections. In addition to that, there are seven smart grid projects that will be installed in Java and Bali. We are also conducting study on electricity toll road or National Nusantara Grid, which connects the electricity network between major islands 
as well as Papua, Maluku, and Nusa Tenggara, so that the electricity of renewable energy from great potential areas can be transmitted to broader areas which lack of resources but high electricity demand. As part of our strategy embracing ambition towards energy transition, the government is also conducting the carbonizing policy, not only for the supply side, but also for the demand side, such as for the transportation sector, we will increase the use of electric vehicles. Shifting to mass transportation, such as mass rapid transit, light rapid transit and electric buses, as well as utilization of biofuel, bioethanol, and green fuels. For industrial sector, we will implement high efficient technology, energy management system, and restructuring energy use. For commercial sector, we will also apply energy management and efficient technology for building sector, as well as green building towards net zero energy building. For household sector, we promote the use of city gas and electric stove and the implementation of minimum energy performance standard and household appliances efficiency. This thing is participants, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, it is important to underline that to successfully implement these energy transitions, there are a variety of science and technologies that can be utilized. Each country has its own respective capabilities and circumstances in transitioning towards sustainable future. Therefore, support and cooperation with other countries and relevant organizations such as IRENA that have well experience in this field will be greatly beneficial in aiding Indonesia's effort to expedite a just, inclusive, and systemic renewable energy transition. Thank you. And that was Indonesian Minister Tasrif speaking for the G20 Presidency 2022. And let me now go to the current G20 Presidency and Italy's Under Secretary for Foreign Affairs, uh, Manlio Di Stefano. And uh, again, if you would just pick up on those two key questions, both what you're doing to uh, accelerate action and also what you're doing in terms of uh, ensuring that it is a just energy transition. Mr. Di Stefano, can you hear me? So perhaps we don't have him with us yet. I will then move That's on. And I'm ah. sorry, we'll be here. Excuse me. We will, we will move on now to our next speaker and hope to come back a little bit later to Mr. Di Stefano. And, uh, ah, there you are. Hello, please. Oh, here ahead. I am. I'm sorry, go ahead. We would no like worries. very much to hear your point of view on those two key questions. The floor Thank is yours. You. Thank you so much. Dear colleagues, dear Director General uh, La Camera, Caro Francesco, First of all, I would like to thank you for organizing this first edition of the Global High Level Forum on Energy Transition, an idea that we supported from the very beginning. The forum represents a great opportunity on one end to focus on the critical relationship between science and rising ambition with a view to the ongoing processes such as the UN High Level Dialogue on Energy and the COP26. On the other hand, to welcome the launch of the full version of IRENA's World Energy Transition Outlook, which Minister Di Maio has already appreciated the last March when he took part to the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. The agency's World Energy Transition Outlook has anticipated a clear pathway to climate neutrality, providing a solid analysis and valuable insights, able to support informed and proactive policies. I particularly appreciate its holistic approach, which adopts a wool of government and whole of society's perspective. Indeed, broadening the perspective of the team of ambition to all the actors involved in the global climate action is an indispensable condition in order to keep the global temperature rise below 1.5 centigrade while ensuring comprehensive socioeconomic benefits. Italy's approach is fully in line with the ambitious policies outlined in the World Energy Transition Outlook. Our country has recently finalized its national recovery and resilience plan, which intends to make the Italian socioeconomic system more sustainable and more prosperous. 
almost 70 billion euros has been allocated for the green revolution and the ecological transition. And we dedicated a specific ministry, the Ministry of Ecological Transition, to this transversal team. The focus is on the complete decarbonization of the system, climate neutrality by 2050, and the, the, on strengthening the adoption of circular economy solutions to protect nature and biodiversity. The main pillars are circular economy and sustainable agriculture, renewable energy, hydrogen, smart grids, and sustainable mobility, energy efficiency and buildings renovation, protection of the territory and of the water resource. However, the energy transition cannot take place in the absence of an equally complex bureaucratic transition and must be inclusive and fair, contributing to change social behavior, to fill the gap among regions and to plan the retraining and the adaptation of workers' skills. This is the approach of the Italian G20 presidency on energy and climate ingot around the three P, people, planet, prosperity. Um, more specifically, while accelerating a clean energy transition, we aim to foster stimulus for a sustainable recovery and to ensure access to clean and affordable energy for all, bearing in mind that now, more than ever, there is a political momentum that we have to duty to keep up for the well-being of present and future generation. The first ever joint energy and climate ministerial in Naples, the 23rd July, will represent a unique opportunity in this regard. In this perspective, our G20 agenda has adopted the, uh, an ambitious program, stressing the need to reach a carbon neutral economy by 2050 and to launch long-term strategies and action plans to ensure net zero emissions by this date. At the same time, it is important to align them with both the recovery plans in the near term and the 2030 medium term targets, taking into account the different national circumstances and differentiated pathways. Moreover, we need to phase out of coal fired power plants and fossil fuel subsidies as soon as possible, redirecting international energy financing towards the transition. We appeal all to all G20 countries around this virtual table to support the presidency to slow, to show leadership to the world and have a successful communique up to the existential challenge we have in front of us. In order to reach our common goals, we have been actively engaging with IRENA. I appreciate the agency's outstanding work in this regard and I wish to underline in particular the relevant contribution offered by the agency's report and recommendation on accelerating the deployment of offshore and ocean, ocean energy. It will be a flagship document of our G20. We also look forward to an ambition COP26. In the context of our prominent role as partner in the UK, our country will make its part hosting the pre-COP26 negotiation in Milan and the end of September back-to-back -back with the Youth for Climate driving the ambition. They are back-to-back -back so to foster a real interaction among the youth, negotiators and ministers. Indeed, these ongoing processes further strengthen our resolve to make this year a real turning point for all countries towards more sustainable, green and inclusive economies and societies. As a virtuous, ambitious and supportive country, Italy intends to work strenuously to ensure the success of the negotiations. I thank you all. Thank, thank you very much, Under Secretary Di Stefano, and thank you also for your leadership on these very, very important uh, points in this make or break year. We go now in this first round to our final speaker uh, on these two first key questions, and he is UAE Minister Al Nuaimi. Please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Melinda. Thank you. Your Excellencies, dear fellow advocates of the energy transition, it's an honor to join you at the Global High Level Forum on Energy Transition. First of all, I would like to congratulate His Excellency Francisco de Camara, Director General of ARENA and the Secretariat on the launch of the landmark report, the World Energy Transition Outlook. We are all aware that an energy transition is necessary to avoid the negative impact of the climate change and that guidance 
is required to build a pragmatic approach. The world energy transition outlook serves as this missing guiding instrument offering solutions in terms of strategies, policies, requirements, and technological advancement, as well as finance requirements and sources. Solutions to get the energy transition off the ground are available. It is now a matter of identifying the optimal and the most efficient solutions for each player and aligning efforts between all. The energy transition is high on the United Arab Emirates agenda. As a hydrocarbon-based economy, we have been in the energy space for decades. We have built knowledge and expertise, not only in technology and infrastructure, but also on the workings of the energy market and serving its needs. We have started our renewable energy journey 15 years ago by founding Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, Masdar, in 2006. In 2009, we built our first utility-scale solar photovoltaic plant. Since then, we have come a long way. Today, our country is home to three of the largest in, in capacity and lowest in cost solar plants in the world. Our clean energy capacity is on track to reach 14 gigawatts by 2030. To date, we have invested over 40 billion US dollars in clean energy projects locally. And earlier this year, we have strengthened our focus on clean hydrogen by launching the Abu Dhabi Hydrogen Alliance. The United Arab Emirates is also committed to advancing the development of renewable energy solutions worldwide by financing renewables ventures in developing countries through Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, the ADFD, direct investment from specialized companies. A prime example is the Mohammed bin Zayed solar photovoltaic complex in Togo, launched recently within the framework of the ARENA ADFD project facilities, in addition to the projects implemented in island countries in Pacific and the Caribbean. We have to understand that each region and country has a different starting point and might move at its own pace. ARENA members rely on events such as the Global High Level Forum to learn from their peers which path is working under what circumstances. With its groundbreaking information, the World Energy Transition Outlook provides guidance for strategies, sitting, and planning. To make it even more relevant, it is important to break this global data down into regional focus, or if possible, even a country specific focuses. We must step up our joint efforts, provide support to developing countries and increase our clean energy ambitious plans. If we want to achieve an inclusive and just energy transition. This is just the beginning of a buildup that will continue through COP26 and beyond. Thank you very much. I thank you very, very much. And we want to pick up uh, on uh, some of those points right now in our second round of discussion. And this is our deeper dive now on cooperation. WITO, of course, underlines the importance of collaboration across sectors, across regions, across stakeholder groups, and says, 
without that, we will not succeed in this radical transformation of energy systems. So let's focus now on how to leverage IRENA's global membership and also the global high level forum itself in order to boost cooperation and move from business as usual to a visionary clean energy future. And I'm going to suggest that because our time, uh, our remaining time in this session is limited, we're looking at about 18 minutes, that I will ask for volunteers uh, who would like to share their views on the issues and actions you would like to see the Global High Level Forum prioritize and also talking about uh, how it can best serve IRENA members, I'm going to now go to uh, the gallery view and ask all of you to please uh, give me a sign if you would like to speak to this question. So uh, you can either do so by pressing the hand raising icon or by simply uh, raising a hand. So for those who have the cameras on, I'm looking, I see, okay, Minister Meza, please go ahead. Thank you, Melinda. And um, just a, a quick remark, I will say that to continue working with this approach of um, having a specific MOUs with, with regional entities, I think that this is a very good approach that IRENA is, is having. And I think that we are uh, promoting these uh, enhanced policy frameworks but I think that we also need to mobilize resources now that will guarantee the implementation of some of these measures that have been established in the NDCs, in the long-term strategies, or in the energy roadmaps that we are elaborating right now. So it's, it's the decade of action, and I think that we also need to mobilize resources for pilot projects which are critical. In which areas? Mobility, uh, or transportation, which is uh, a very central point in, in the region, access to energy, and this other element of how decentralization is affecting the new business model for utilities. I think that we have a big issue there that also needs to be addressed. And uh, the other element, I will say, is a discussion or analysis on, on gas and natural gas. And I think that there is a conversation there because some are mentioning natural gas as a transition in energy, but I think that this also has an impact in the 1.5 uh, scenario. And, and it's a conversation that we need to have. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also had uh, hand uh, signals uh, from EOSIS, uh, Mr. Hunter, and from Ghana, Minister Prempe. So I'll go to uh, Mr. Hunter, uh, Hunter and then to, uh, to, Minister, to Minister Prempe, please. Uh, as the previous speakers have indicated, the WITO presentation policy is of certainly a good framework, and we welcome this, of course. But looking at this, and I listened to the Director General. And the summary which I have read certainly gives us some hope because it speaks of GDP increase with a 1.5C, jobs and the like. But what's missing for small island developing states is a more granular outlook. All of this is global. So how do you take a global outlook with figures as Francisco have indicated? Uh, I think I took note 11.5 to 4.3 million jobs. What does that translate for a small island developing state? I mean, we are like 40 something countries. And of course, our com contribution to all of this is about 1.5% of the emissions. And then you're giving us some hope that there will be jobs. So maybe if the secretary looks at other ways of translating, as Francisco has indicated, if there's a possibility to give in more granular outlook of regions or subsectors, so we can have some hope as to if it's possible when we're making this transition, there is something from that cake for us because a granular outlook with millions of jobs doesn't tell a small island state anything. We're certainly committed. We have made a number of commitments to transition to renewable energy, and we will continue. But of course, what's missing is, of course, our partners. As we can see, most of them, none of them are actually on the path to 1.53 as, as we look around. None. So 
we need their commitment to the NDCs and to ensure that there is some level of agreement that we can walk away with at COP26, that they are also committed as we are. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you very much. And let me go now to Ghana and Minister Prebet, please. Thank you very much. In light of what has just been said, uh, most of the African countries, especially Ghana, are going through this transition period, looking for friends and support uh, in order for us to traverse this period. What do I mean? Uh, we certainly lack the technology, you know, the financing uh, to be able to go through this without ballooning uh, already huge debts that we hang on our necks. So this talk, this serious debate, this serious engagement with energy clean energy transition must be backed up with the international financial institutions, the multilaterals, the bilaterals, the donor partners, really bringing in investment in technology and funds to enable us to, because we found gas in abundance. And most of these countries that contribute to 98% in the deterioration of the climate are still using gas and some of them are even using coal. So even if gas is being put off the table, then really the funds and the technology uh, to enable us to traverse that path should come from those who want us to participate in the clean energy uh, um, 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 challenge that faces us. But certainly, we want to adopt electric vehicles because it's good for our health and our climate. Uh, we, we, we want to go have energy access to everybody that doesn't exist. Uh, we want to also industrialize. That means our energy challenge is huge. And if we are going to use uh, renewables, that is not certainly the best so far for our base loads, then the challenge is probably on the other foot to provide the technology and the resources, the funding to enable us to participate in that agenda fully well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, recent studies show that uh, most uh, green investment flows, which are not yet sufficient, but even so, most are flowing to just a handful of industrial countries uh, rather than being widely distributed. So let me go now to Vice Minister Chaturvedi, please. The floor is yours. Very much. Uh, we are glad that the, that the outlook which you have published uh, makes uh, stresses upon the importance of international collaborations. And uh, one of the earlier speakers made this point that Irina should, should support uh, more granular studies of regions and countries. We support this point. We, we would be very happy if you do that. Uh, one point I really wanted to stress upon is the role of the ISA, and in particular, with reference to, to flow of finances to, to regions which, which need it most. Uh, I think Irena has a, has, a, has a partnership with ISA going. going. And uh, uh, we would really be happy if that, that partnerships move ahead. And uh, we would urge other countries to support uh, ISA because uh, I think ISA has been working with a focus to, to take up projects in Africa particularly and uh, has been exploring options on how to mitigate risks and, and uh, arrange for flow of finances. So that is one area which, where India would urge other countries to really chip in. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see that we have now been joined by Torsten Herdan. So um, uh, Torsten, Director General, it's, uh, it's great to see you. And uh, we have had a very, very interesting discussion here uh, on all three of our key questions, starting with the question of how uh, the various uh, actors uh, represented on our panel are moving to truly accelerate and boost action, uh, given the fact that we are are not where we need to be. Secondly, uh, uh, some very uh, interesting input on what uh, countries and uh, regional groupings are doing to make sure this is a just tradition that leaves as a transition that leaves no one behind. And then now we have just embarked on our discussion of the role of collaboration with uh, several countries underlining how important it is also to get uh, adequate uh, funds flowing to those countries that need it most. So please speak to any or all of uh, these points uh, that you would care to address. The floor is yours. 
Melinda, thank you very much, and uh, sorry for being somewhat late. Uh, it is a was a multiple of uh, tasks. We we had our last parliamentary week uh, last week, and there is some still to uh, react on uh, legislation uh, issues. Uh, we, as as everybody knows, perhaps um, have been um, even more um, call it aggressive in terms of, um, of of carbon neutrality because now we have in Germany our goal uh, from 2050 to be carbon neutral changed into 2045 that are only four year, five years but uh, it doesn't sound much but it is a huge effort uh, and there is a very specific reason why we are doing that um, and that is um, to, to send a clear signal um, to the world that uh, also Germany being only responsible uh, for 2% of the CO2 emissions worldwide, uh, it is a huge responsibility that we show other countries that um, in Germany it is possible. Uh, also, we are highly industrialized and uh, highly density of um, population. Uh, and that we <clears throat> demonstrate that uh, it is possible and um, that should be also a signal as uh, one of the IRENA members with perhaps uh, some sort of history, uh, Francesco, uh, in IRENA, which is uh, a bigger one than other countries, um, that we will um, help um, others, that we will help IRENA um, to showcase what is possible. And therefore, um, Francesco, I'm extremely happy uh, about the World Energy Transition Outlook 2021 uh, prepared by IRENA and also on that high level panel, um, because uh, it can only be done, uh, as Melinda said, uh, and uh, some of the others said, which are followed in between, um, if we uh, to foster much more collaboration as we have already. And there is only one perfect uh, organization worldwide, uh, and that is IRENA, uh, because uh, may I forget perhaps the few countries not being members of IRENA, then one can say that uh, every country in the world is a member of IRENA. Why? Because every country in the world uh, has uh, recognized um, and understood um, that the train is running. And the train uh, means climate neutrality, the train means um, energy, transition and the train means renewable energy. And we all know that um, the um, big instrument in our hand is renewable energy. Um, it has already become a commodity in many, many countries around the world. And uh, with the new, I call it energy carrier, uh, we are discussing um, the whole day uh, up and down, uh, which is hydrogen it is possible to carry around renewable energy produced by wind, PV, biomass, geothermal, and, 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 uh, from one place in the world to another. But it can only be carried around if we do um, not only intensify cooperation, but if we also build up new cooperation uh, with countries which have not yet um, traded energy. And there is also a message we, what we would like to send out from Germany. We as Germany being part of Europe uh, will forever rely on energy imports because um, our energy need is much bigger than the possibility we have in Germany to feed this uh, energy need with our domestic um, resources. So the wind resources, the PV resources uh, are too small in order to uh, feed our energy needs. So we are an energy importer uh, today and we will remain an energy importer tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. But um, the type of energy we are importing uh, will change, has to change and must change. Uh, so we're now importing mainly fossils uh, and we need to change that into the import of renewables. Um, and uh, by doing that, uh, it is again only that one organization worldwide, uh, which is called IRENA, uh, which uh, can help to foster that uh, type of collaboration in order to find government to government dialogues, in order to find government to business, to business to government dialogues uh, with the various uh, countries around the world, which, as I said, are not trading energy today, but which will trade energy tomorrow. 
And I will not name uh, certain countries because that is always the problem that I do not name others. But um, many of you know that we have uh, a lot of energy partnerships where we are specifically focusing on how can we foster, how can we strengthen the deployment of renewables um, in, the, in these respective countries and how can we help the countries to, of course, first of all, uh, use their renewables on their own. That is always the first choice, always the first choice. But if they have the possibility uh, to also export those renewables, we are very happy to be um, a customer of those uh, exports of, of renewables, uh, as I said, because we need them. And for us, and there comes another aspect in the game, um, the energy transition, the climate neutrality goal, uh, and um, the trading possibility uh, is an absolute positive element because it is all also a peacemaking element. So with the task of IRENA to bring all those countries together, it is not only on renewables, it is not only on climate neutrality, it is also on peacemaking uh, activity because those countries uh, which trade with each other, first of all, they are not only trading energy, they are also trading other goods alongside with that. And normally those countries which uh, trade with each other um, are living much more better together than those uh, which do not trade with each other. So it is very important to also point uh, out this very important aspect. So for us, it is really a point that we have uh, climate neutrality, energy transition, um, cooperation, collaboration, trading and peacemaking activity. And for all of that, uh, Irina stands uh, as a proof that this is possible and uh, with the um, uh, world energy transition outlook 2021 uh, it is absolutely clear that uh, that all goes together with uh, uh, wealth uh, with more uh, people um, being employed um, and uh, with prosperity and whatever good signal we need uh, th that is the most important one and uh, again Francesco, thank you very much for that very, very good work. Torsten, Herden, if I may, just one very quick uh, follow-up question. And uh, I have an eye on the clock, and I'd say we have about one minute. Uh, but if you could just name what for you would be the top priority right now going forward in terms of issues or tasks for the Global High Level Forum. Of course, this is uh, its, uh, its maiden voyage, so to speak. So where would you want to see it sailing toward uh, in the near future? Really, uh, the, trans, uh, the, the, the composition of those uh, countries, of those regions uh, which work together, and uh, that's uh, guided by IRENA, that is for us uh, the most important uh, priority uh, we can think of. Um, and um, we are on a good way with IRENA on that, but that is of most importance. Thank you very, very much to Torsten Hadden. Thank you very, very much to all of our panel for sharing your insights for this very thought-provoking debate that we have had, and also for your recognition of some of those crucial findings uh, in uh, IRENA's World Energy Transition Outlook and how they relate to your own pathways in terms both of accelerating climate action and making sure that the transition does take all citizens along in order to ensure that that transition is viable and effective, because I think all of us recognize uh, those very important uh, societal benefits that are outlined in the WITO, but of course it's so important to make citizens aware uh, of those benefits and aware that uh, this is something uh, that, that will bring gains for societies as a whole. So I'd like to thank all of you for being with us for this, uh, for this high level moderated discussion. And it is now my honor to hand the floor back to our chair, to Her Excellency, Teresa Ribera. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Green, Melinda, for this very uh, good guiding of the high level panel discussion and all the comments being made by all the panelists on the many different aspects that relate to this energy transition set of challenges. I think that uh, one of the most interesting things is to, 
to confirm to what extent all the realizations of uh, the Paris Agreement uh, um, are still needing some additional efforts, but at the same time, to what extent it is important to take into consideration the very different experiences, backgrounds and challenges in each country. Um, I think that uh, it has been pretty clear that each country, each region, its uh, local context provides a different context and a starting point that can differ from one country to another, including the priorities from one society to a different one. And I think that this is something very important to take into consideration when dealing with uh, the policies to drive the energy transition if we want to succeed. If we do not take uh, full consideration of the main aspirations and challenges, difficulties um, and opportunities of um, each of our countries, it would be even more difficult and we would not have um, the opportunity to experience all the benefits of uh, many things that we can uh, introduce, put in place um, in a very short period of time. This is why it is also important to keep open this type of um, uh, global assessments, but also this um, opportunity to uh, change views among the different uh, um, players of this energy transition in different uh, places of, of the world. The cooperation among uh, all of us and among um, all the local players, stakeholders is very important. The different uh, sectoral and regional approaches can help because we can enhance uh, the impact of the positive things and we can dilute uh, the difficulties by uh, sharing the benefits of um, our action. We need to mobilize resources for implementation. And we need um, guidance in the good direction. We do not know every single thing. This is a learning process. And um, sharing experiences, uh, thinking uh, on what type of uh, guidance we can provide and what type of guidance we can build among ourselves. It is very important to facilitate action in critical sectors. Some of them are still quite challenging, such as uh, mobility, transportation, how we can face the decarbonization of um, the transport um, in this um, in this world uh, through the different technological solutions, but also through the cultural behavior that uh, is uh, changing, but uh, which is uh, still a challenge. So I think that we need many conversations to be pushed forward. Uh, some of you have expressed some concerns on what is the role for gas and to what extent um, we, we need to pay attention to, to avoid getting trapped in something that, of course, it may be important in the transition, but it is not the transition. So to, to build on what we have, but to pay attention to any additional uh, references we may uh, include uh, when dealing with, uh, with gas. We have also heard um, to what extent in many developing countries, energy access, energy poverty is still a very important goal for any uh, person in charge of uh, public policies, but also for anyone in the society willing to provide comfort to, to, the, to the citizens. So I think that this is, this is something which is, of course, a top priority. Yeah, for anyone in the world. And to that purpose, um, we need to, to strive, we need to strengthen our capacity to mobilize uh, finance uh, through uh, public means, but also through private uh, private means. Um, in, in some cases, technology is not an issue. Technology is already available um, in, in very good shape and we can access to that. But in some other cases, to facilitate access of technologies and to, 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 to develop the skills that we may need to make full use and to take full advantage of those technologies is still something that um, deserves uh, further attention and further, further investment. Uh, so it's very important to recognize and to underline that this is a very top priority uh, for all, but in particular uh, for many in different regions of, of the world. And another aspect I would like to, to stress, and with this um, I, could, I could end my comments, is that um, uh, bearing in mind the environmental and social aspects of the energy transition is probably uh, um, the cornerstone of uh, uh, making our lives easier or making our lives more difficult. So this is something which is 
important. There are some uh, experiences, some clues on how we can proceed in order to facilitate these considerations, but still many things to be learned and to be spread a little bit everywhere. I could uh, say that the diversity of um, the approaches being, being um, uh, introduced by the different panelists is very rich and help um, all of us to, to enrich our capacity, our knowledge, our understanding, and um, the response we, we may need to, to provide for many of the aspects that are still unknown or not sufficiently known. So thanks a lot for all your comments. I, I will work closely with the Secretary to capture all the issues that uh, you have uh, mentioned, you have raised, so that we can ensure that we can make full use of um, all your comments and observations. And with this, I would like to, to thank you all again for having this opportunity to be with you and to, to, to take full profit of this very fruitful discussion. Very much in particular uh, to Melinda, uh, the panelists, and of course to Francesco, who has facilitated this conversation together with the World Energy Transition Outlook in this very first occasion to meet uh, around this high-level panel on energy transition. Together with all your team, Francesco, you are making, you are doing a great job. So. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. I invite you to stay on after we close the meeting for the airing of the high-level fireside chat session moderated by Mrs. Becky Anderson, Managing Editor of CNN Abu Dhabi. But before that, I would like to uh, give the floor to Francesco for his uh, final uh, insightful remarks and comments and conclusions. So thank you so much uh, to you all and stay well and healthy. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear President and uh, Vice Prime Minister. I, I have to say that I really enjoy the, 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 the discussion. You know, we have been uh, able uh, at the end, also in this uh, special format, because the next high level uh, forum, uh, we will have, I'm sure in person, and with a more robust program. But at the same time, we have been able to, to make everyone the possibility to, to express uh, himself or herself uh, with a, a sufficient time for that in a very, uh, uh, I say, nice di discussion. We have been uh, excellent people uh, with us and with uh, ensuring also a geographical presence, so all countries reflecting the uh, global membership of ARENA. We have been also able to ensure a sufficient or acceptable gender balance in this meeting. So in some way, I, I can say that there's been a really a start of this high-level formal energy transition is in the style of, uh, of ARENA. Many good arguments has been uh, raised, and uh, I'm sure that the president uh, will uh, will work with the secretary on uh, on uh, and capitalize on uh, what has been said. I think that uh, has been uh, a call coming from. Uh, as I remember Andrea Meza told this about uh, to pay attention of the end use sector, so they have 100 uh, percent electricity generation, but they have. The energy system, the end use are important. So, transport, buildings, heavy industries, where a lot has to be done to, to greening the, the system. So, the end of use sector, I can ensure, is uh, in the attention of the Secretariat and is one of the team where the ARENA is playing a substantial leading role worldwide. Uh, as been also mentioned, uh, Corrad has talked about the fact that. Uh, the World Energy Transition Out, and, and I thank you for the warm, uh, uh, I say, acceptance of, uh, of this report, but make clear that it is global. So we express an average. But how important is that we, we make possible this uh, report fitting in the different realities, because the implementation of, of the World Energy Transition Out will be different in the different regions. I think also the Minister for Climate Change, Environment, Climate Change of the UAE 
mention the fact that anyone has to employ uh, to do this in uh, along with its capacity, capability, and characteristics. I think also the chair of IPCC has mentioned that. And uh, uh, also Andrea, I think, and others may clear reference to the sense of uh, trying to glamorate, uh, glamorate the, the, the world energy transition at regional level. And uh, we, will, um, we are working to present in the occasion of COP26 and then to the General Assembly, next General Assembly of ARENA, a program for granulate the uh, world energy transition outlook in all the regions of, uh, of ARENA. So this is uh, a commitment that we take today and we will work heavily on, on, uh, on, uh, on that. Concerning oil and gas transition, we have, uh, I think you have all received my letter on proposing the establishing of a new, uh, a new collaborative framework that will be the place where all these elements, all this discussion may take place, also with the participation of the companies, the governments, or the stakeholders, so it will be a very full uh, uh, and meaningful the, the discussion. Uh, uh, the Minister from Ghana make a very good point when we talk about industrialization. So we, we will never ensure equality. And uh, uh, if you don't uh, support not only the movement or the transition, but also support the building of uh, the uh, industrial uh, organization that may support worldwide this. So the, the supply chain has to be built in a way that will ensure a more equal outputs in terms of economic of opportunity for the least developed country, for the small islands with their own characteristics together with all the other countries. As been mentioned, the relation to the ISA, we are working with, uh, with them. I have already the pleasure to have a, 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 a meeting, unfortunately, virtual with a new chief of uh, ISA. And we are working also with India to build a kind of strategic uh, uh, partnership uh, between uh, ARENA and that important uh, country in the, in the world uh, landscape. International cooperation has been mentioned by, by, by all of you, is very important. Torsten has spent a lot of thought on that. We, uh, as ARENA, we are the place, we think, that, uh, that may enhance the international cooperation. We have uh, the, uh, the re the, our knowledge capacity. We have our planning support for countries, but we have also financial instruments uh, uh, starting to, to give result as the climate investment platform with more than 300 uh, among uh, multilateral financial institutions, companies, development agency, uh, development bank. And we have already piling up a project that may think will be bankable, when at the same time we are working for renewing the, uh, the uh, ARENA uh, FRD uh, facility that where also other entities may be called to take, uh, to take part of. Uh, of. And uh, in, uh, in closing, uh, I, I wish also to, to, to mention that uh, the uh, World Energy uh, Transition Outlook has been the basis as has been acknowledged in the, uh, in the report that has been prepared under the energy transition track that will go to the high-level dialogue in New York to recognize uh, how our uh, uh, analysis available and worldwide uh, accepted as we are working uh, towards the, 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 COP, uh, the COP26. Uh, and uh, again, uh, also the co again the comment on Tosen of the role of Arena, not only because we are working in uh, the energy transition, but the energy transition is also being working in building cooperation, in building peace. And I think our work on the geopolitics, we will launch the first uh, part of the our report focusing on green hydrogen in the occasion of our next general assembly will be a step. In this, uh, in this, in this uh, uh, regard. So allow me at the end uh, uh, to thank all of you to, who have been participating to this meeting. So the keynote speaker, the, the panelists, 
I already I always uh, consider you as a as a as a friend. And I would like to talk uh, to thank uh, Melinda by the way she has been able to manage the discussion. It was really lively, and uh, allow me at the end to express my special thanks to Prime Minister Ribera for his leadership, if I can say, for her friendship. And uh, so has been, a, has been a, a, is an excellent president of ARENA. We are very proud to work under a, a leadership. So with closing word, I, I give you back to you, Teresa, if you're still there. And if you already left, sorry, it will be my, my task to thank all of you for being part of the discussion. And also I wish to thank all that has been listening to you through our social means. So thank you very much. Thank you all to all of you. Grazie. Hello and welcome. I'm Becky Anderson and it's my distinct pleasure today to be hosting this fireside chat as part of the forum. There's no doubt that the need for bold commitments and accelerated action on the energy transition couldn't be more important and timely given the significant climate challenges that the world faces. This session is designed to take a deep dive into the core aspects of IRENA's newly released World Energy Transition Outlook, a transition that the agency argues should not be considered as fuel replacement, but an entirely new global system with different technologies and with significant economic, social and geopolitical consequences. Well, to discuss the merits, without further ado, let me introduce my esteemed guests, Francesco La Camera is the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. And Teresa Ribera is the Spanish Vice President and Minister for Ecological Transition. Thank you both for joining us today. Francesco, let me start with you. What do you believe policymakers need to take away from this report? So... Uh... If I can say in a few words, you know, all are working to design a scenario that is uh, compatible and may bring the world in line with the 1.5 uh, degree uh, of the IPPC scenario to fight climate change and contain the rise of temperature. But it's not just a question of technology, how to get there. It's also a question of uh, policies to put in place to make the change possible and accelerate the, the transition that is already anyway in place. So what is in the main tech way that uh, may come to the report? Look at all the suggestion in terms of instrument that we can use, country can use in the different reality around the world to accelerate the path of energy transition. Because as uh, we have said many times, in this moment, the most important variable is time. If we want to succeed in being aligned with the Paris Agreement, we have to rush and we have to rush now. What concrete measures is Irina suggesting can be implemented immediately to address the imbalances in the energy sector? So, you know, we are, we are, we are we are, very, we are very clear in our report on this. Naturally, first thing is phasing out uh, coal as soon as possible, limiting the investment in oil and gas just to allow a Swiss decline of the, particip the participation of oil and gas in our energy system toward the, 20, the 2050, investing heavily in infrastructure that may allow a high share of renewables to, to be part of, of the system. So these are the, the main elements that are in, in, our, in our report. And naturally, be careful. The policy, uh, the politician has to be sure that in making this transition, as any transition, we have someone that is losing, someone that is gain, 
but we have to play a, a, a game that at the end can be beneficial for all. And I think that the report is, uh, the outlook is very useful in making clear how it's possible to make this transition to be an added value for a healthier, wealthier, and more econ economical way of life for everyone. And we'll drill down on some of the key data before we do that. Teresa, can you put Irina's work into a policy-making context as pressure for countries to do more intensifies? I think that uh, one of the main messages coming from this IRENA report is that there is not an issue of replacing some technologies by different technologies that uh, are already reachable, but um, it is required to have a comprehensive and systematic approach. What we talk about when we talk about energy, we are talking about heating and cooling, we are talking about mobility, we are talking about producing goods in industry, how we make this transformation possible. And uh, this will demand something which is also a stress in the report. This requires a cultural change. This implies that we policymakers need to make life easier for those um, experiencing the transformation. We need to experience the benefits, but we also need to facilitate the phase out of all those things. So it is a kind of um, guiding tool to promote and to push a, um, a speedy transformation uh, to benefit all societies. And Teresa, I want to draw on your experience in Spain to that degree. Francesco, firstly, your report says that by 2050, there will be double the number of energy jobs than there is today if we move to a net zero system. 122 million is the number that your report suggests. And yet we know that fossil fuel communities all over the world have a real fear about their futures. Moving away from fossil fuels to the extent you recommend will be extremely difficult, socially and economically devastating, some say, for many regions. Do you concede that point? Absolutely. I think this is a very critical uh... Uh, point, Teresa will, uh, will teach me that uh, if you don't take care of this aspect, making the transition possible will be very difficult. So we have to work for clarify and make possible that uh, uh, as in any transition, some people are starting to afraid on what they can lose and they have no the sense of what they can achieve through the transition. So our report is also helping the, 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 the politicians to, to, to make clear to the, to the public how make the transition possible and accelerate it will bring more jobs because at the end we show, uh, and this is I think that's something that is uh, very solid, how not only will increase the number of people working in the energy sector, but the share of the people are working on renewables will rise, and uh, this includes the people working on the energy transition, the, the people working in the infrastructure. So this, uh, this is no doubt, and uh, hopefully our report make, make this clear, that uh, going for the transition will bring more jobs. So from a social point of view, it could be really beneficial for, uh, for the population. Because, of course, this transition must not leave anybody behind. Teresa, fossil job losses are inevitable as we move to a system, a new energy system under IRENA's roadmap. Now, fossil fuels currently account for 86% of Spain's energy mix. As I understand it, the plan for Spain is to generate 70% of its electricity from renewables by 2050. That is a huge change. And the social disruption will be an inevitable consequence, will it not, of this transition? Well, I think that we are uh, already embarking in this transformation. Um, three years ago, uh, there were more than 25% of the electricity being produced through uh, fossil fuel uh, technologies related systems. And now it is between 10 and 12. So in three years, uh, we have a phase out 
more than a half of we had of what we had uh, not so far uh, ago. I think that the most important thing is to anticipate and to prepare other opportunities for people. I'm sure that you, Becky, working in the media, uh, um, would uh, love to, to to work in your own type of job. But if uh, there are if there are slight changes in the in the way you express your capacities and skills. You could be curious on what next if something interesting is in front of you. And this also comes along with people working in the energy sector. Primary, they want to have a job, that's for sure. But secondly, if there are interesting opportunities in related activities, they could be open to, to make this transformation, this chance. This is why I think that the social preparedness, the skillful uh, uh, people trying to reskill whatever needs um, uh, we may identify, and um, feeding into the economic uh, system so to create new opportunities is very, very important. This is why what we, why we have um, invested so much in the just transition, working with the workers' unions, local authorities, and of course the business um, corporates uh, dealing with energy. And I think that this, this, this can this can be accelerated in the years to come. And this is why it is so important to invest since the very first moment to anticipate, to understand, and to create, to create related opportunities for people. I think that this is crucial if we want to succeed. Let's just talk about the successes that you can point to from Spain to date in terms of how you navigate this challenge, if you will. As I said, in, in uh, three, four years, we will be facing out more than 85% of our coal capacity, closing all coal mines, closing all coal plants, and um, going towards a much more efficient, renewable energy system. And the energy system is important. It's not just power, but it is, as I said, mobility. It is also cooling, or it is um, the use of energy in the industrial sectors. And um, this provides a great range of opportunities. So how we, uh, in the um, political, in the public institutions, can play a role to facilitate this transformation? And this is not so simple, because we need to touch many different keys in the keyboard. We need to facilitate uh, funding for entrepreneurs or for other business opportunities to promote an easy and uh, quick uh, ramp up. We need to uh, ensure that there are real skilling opportunities for those uh, leaving the type of job and entering into a different type of job. We need to be sure that people is in a position to, to, to get an appropriation of the agenda. It's not someone else is imposing a future, but it is that uh, the local communities envisaging what are the, the, um, the strong points, the strong references to, to build their own identity for the time to come. And it needs respect. It needs dignity. It needs it needs recognition for those that um, all along different generations have been providing wealth for the, for the whole community. Because sometimes we tend to say, well, fossil fuels is the past and it was uh, something that created climate change problems. So it is connected to bad things. And of course, we, we, we know that this is the case when we look into the past. But it is true that when people uh, were investing their lives in this type of energy solutions, they were thinking, I'm, think, I'm finding, I'm feeling proud because of their contribution to the, um, to the welfare of their own societies and communities. So I think that um, the technical aspects, as I said, are important. The economic understanding, the time anticipation is very important, but also the social recognition and the empathy for those that um, are experiencing this deep transformation in their day-to-day -day lives. Francesco, the price tag against this energy transition as uh, promoted by your report is enormous. Irina has made clear that significant investments are necessary to get us to one and a half Celsius, around $131 trillion. That equates to $4.4 trillion per year. I just wonder how realistic you believe that is and where the money will come from. So naturally, if we put a number, uh, we, we think that it's realistic. 
uh, when we talk about the one, uh, 131 trillion US dollar, we think about uh, the existing commitment in terms of the plans of the government, what we call it in our uh, outlook, the planning scenario, that is around uh, 98 trillion. So we are talking about adding 30 and more US dollar, US trillion dollars to this investment. We are also thinking of moving part of the, the planet's investment to the energy transition, some, some, something like about 24 trillion US dollar. But just to, to, to give the sense of uh, how real and possible, if there is the, 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 the right commitment, this uh, number may become a reality. You know that the world GDP is 90 trillion in 2019. And the domestic capital formation is around moving the years between uh, 18 to 25 percent. So we are talking about uh, 20 trillion US dollars. So we are talking about the 25 percent of the investment to be directly straight to the energy transformation. And uh, as uh, Teresa Ribera can teach us, the European Union also under its efforts and its leadership has come to say that the 30% of investment has to go to the, to the energy transition. So I think it's important and uh, absolutely uh, real this number. Naturally, this implies a, a double of the efforts of the government in uh, providing funding for this, uh, this, uh, this transition in form of uh, equity, in form of uh, uh, blend, uh, blend money, lend money through the multilateral financial institution. This is not really important, but it's also possible because the liquidity is, uh, is there and we have to guide the liquidity to the right priorities. So we think that uh, uh, this is possible. The, 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 the outlook shows in the details what is to be done uh, on, a global, uh, on a global scale. And uh, if you have listened on what Spain is doing in its own country on driving the energy transformation, you realize how important is the policies to make things happen. So our outlook is there with uh, the, the, uh, the provision. And if there is enough commitment around the world, that number, those numbers will become a reality. Despite promising green recoveries, Teresa, G7 nations have pumped billions of dollars more into fossil fuels than they have into clean energy since the pandemic. Let's be quite clear here. Is that not concrete evidence that wealthy nations are reluctant to invest what is needed into technologies that will support the fast decarbonization of their economies? I think this is a shame. So no other word than uh, shameful. And I think that it is possible to redirect our public and private investments towards something different. I do like the idea of the European Commission pushing for this principle of not doing significant harm to the environment when tackling any type of uh, small or big investment being funded by European public funds. And I think that this should be a principle to be applied when discussing the public budgets, but also when discussing the, um, the strategic investments in any corporate and, of course, in the financial sector. I think that the main issue is not an, a problem of um, a lacking money. The main issue is a, a, an issue of understanding value and cost. And the financial sector, should public and private uh, financial uh, institutions can facilitate breaching this uh, future, this present towards the future. And of course, we need to be flexible with some um, uh, elements to phase out uh, fossil fuels. And we need to, to accept that the phase out needs to be properly combined with the phasing of the new energy alternatives. But this is also a learning process. We need to identify how to divest, how to reinvest, and how to make um, our life uh, not uh, increasingly difficult, but increasingly easier. And this is why the policy counts. And this is why the transparency counts. And this is why there is this idea of building a kind of green taxonomy to provide some clues and in, um, insights on, on where we invest or where we dig our money. And, and to me, this is absolutely key. But you know, when uh, we have decided to retrofit our buildings, when we decide 
what type of renovation wave we want to promote, the main problem has not been access to funding. The main problem has been how to organize all the skills that we need to combine. So architectural skills, uh, pumpers, electricians, uh, energy services, how we can combine all these things in a way that works, that is acceptable for people. And, um, and this is not an easy task. I think that we cannot say this is automatic, this is very clear, this makes sense, and then it is going to happen. No, I think that the human factor counts and we need to build a, um, an environment that facilitates this type of decisions. You you have been successful, Teresa Rivera, in securing um, quite some support to focus Spain's recovery on the transition. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that environmental activists are currently taking your government to court over uh, targets outlined in Spain's climate change and energy transition bill, Ooh. targets they say... Uh, fall far short of what is needed. How do you respond to critics who say the Spanish government is not listening to science? Well, I think we are listening to science. And in fact, we are committed by law to become carbon neutral before 2050. And we have uh, built a very credible and uh, demanding a pathway from now till 2050 to, to reach this, um, this full decarbonization with some intermediate targets that you have been pointing out, 74, 74% of the electricity being renewable in, um, in 2030, 42% of uh, the final use of energy being renewable by 2030, and uh, 39% uh, of um, energy efficiency rates. So it is quite demanding. And we come from a situation where yeah, these climate policies were not so much in the middle of um, in the core action of the public institutions. So have, we have gone very, very fast in these three years, and our intention is to keep on going in a way that can be acceptable by people, because this is very important. We, we think that it is very important that the society understands why and experiences the benefits, and even if it is very accelerated, it goes along with people. I think that it is very interesting to see how the NGOs are demanding even more. And I think that uh, this shows to what extent a big share of the society wants to be even faster, which is very important in order to facilitate, to feed additional action coming from the different governments, but also coming from the private companies. I think that we need to uh, build synergies between the national governments and the local governments and the regional governments, and sometimes some of these are more reluctant than others. So I think that this push is quite, quite important. Let's see how the court uh, reacts on this. But as I said, if it, is, um, if it is the case, then the Supreme Court finally states that we need to do more. It is very interesting because it, it shows to what extent they, um, there is a big, deeper understanding on the importance to build fairness towards the next generations and we need to accelerate action. So for those being reluctant, private or public companies, it is a very strong measure. And uh, it would be, of course, pretty demanding on our side to identify measures that are consistent and viable, even if they are very demanding and, and quite tough. But I think that it is good. And if not, as I said, what we have in mind, what we have uh, already planned and passed through the different laws is a uh, pretty demanding, full of action, and, uh, and ensures this, um, this uh, long-term goal of full decarbonization of our economy before 2020. None of this is easy. Uh, you are nodding, Francesco. Uh, do you want to respond? No, I would say there is no responding. That's, I think that uh, uh, Ribera has used the same word that I may use to describe the situation. So and I'm, I completely agree with her. Uh, there, but it's not the only time that we agree on something. So, <laughs> The organization that you run uh, is, of course, based here uh, in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi. And the Gulf region has made quite big commitments to hydrogen, both blue and green. Why are we seeing that? And does hydrogen potentially represent a commercially viable opportunity for oil companies and for fossil fuel economies. So we are we are we are seeing with interest what is happening uh, is happening here as a kind of uh, uh, laboratory in uh, in uh, in full action 
Uh, we have been uh, present, uh, I think, a couple or three weeks ago in the, in the inauguration of this uh, new green hydrogen plant close to Dubai. is a pilot uh, plant but, uh, that uh, still have uh, a high price of uh, production, uh, around uh, $4 per kilo of green hydrogen. Uh, but uh, shortly, uh, when the, 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 the plant will be growing, they will be competitive in a very short term. So I think here they are looking at uh, the future of the energy system. And uh, they think that uh, at the end, uh, green hydrogen will become uh, a commodity that may be distributed uh, around the world. In our outlook, we think that uh, in, in 2050, we will have uh, 12% of uh, green hydrogen around the world. And green hydrogen can be uh, competitive, especially when we have uh, the, the renewable energy at, uh, at a reasonable cost. So this is a region where we have the, they have the sun, they have the, the, the wind, they have all uh, that can be, and we are, they have also the experience of the complex markets of uh, oil and gas, so the, how to distribute uh, energy around the world. So they think that green hydrogen, the molecule, may be very important. Uh, all recognize the, the key role that green hydrogen may be in electrify sectors that are very difficult to electrify, so I, like the heavy industries, the long shipping, and uh, you know that uh, the, there are parts of the world that cannot produce themselves the green hydrogen. For example, uh, Europe as a, a continent will be difficult to produce uh, at home all the green hydrogen they, 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 they may use. So it's important to look at the other reality. And so it could be a, an important market, again, not only for the green hydrogen, but also for the mo molecule that could be used in the long shipping as for the having industries. So they are investing in the, in the future. And this is particularly, uh, I to say, attractive to see how this region is, uh, is leading on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on this respect. And also the recent announcement that the UAE intend to host the COP28, uh, I think is another clear signal how the region want to move to the, to the uh, accelerate the, the, the path towards a clean energy system. And you very much see that pivot away from oil and gas here towards clean energy um, as, as somebody who lives in this, in this country and in this region. Uh, Teresa Ribeira, how does Spain view the opportunities presented by the hydrogen economy? And, and what role is the country's private sector playing in responding to these opportunities? We, we think that uh, green hydrogen is, um, is, uh, is a must, probably is one of the, those drivers that can facilitate uh, the transformation where we cannot count on other technical options for the time being. So those X that need to be clarified, what they could mean. And this is a kind of um, opportunity we don't want to miss. I think that Spain, as uh, some other countries, in uh, Southern Europe and, of course, uh, in the region where you are and uh, in those sunny countries, uh, is, is blessed by the, the, um, the, the wind and the sun. And we are in a position uh, to, 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 to produce hydrogen through renewable energy. At the same time, we know that uh, public uh, spending uh, should be uh, justified because of the change that uh, it can drive. And this is why we are quite reluctant, if not um, opponents, to the fact of promoting blue, uh, gray hydrogen with public money. I think that uh, it is still expensive because it is still at the, um, at the, uh, at the first phases of the learning curve. Uh, and it makes sense to come along with this, with this funding to facilitate the transformation if it makes sense as a means to decarbonize the economy, not for whatever, not because it is interesting as an innovative um, approach. It is interesting, it is innovative, but then go on your own. But uh, if we need public funding, if public support, let's go directly to what it makes sense in terms of climate policies. The private sector in Spain is fully interested. I think that we count on a very diversified and interesting a private sector in all the um, different um, pieces of the value chain. So the, those have been interested to, to build electrolyzers, to produce electrolyzers, so the goods that facilitate um, the process, 
those are uh, willing to be part and experience and be key players in the transportation of the hydrogen through shipping or through uh, pipelines, those who are interested in the final use of hydrogen for fertilizers, for chemical purposes, for mobility, or for um, uh, energy-intense industry. And we, are, uh, we count on the national strategy on green hydrogen, and we will be dedicating public funding to check and go all along the different steps, the different phases of this value chain, including the final uses, so that we can uh, learn since the very beginning what uh, what processes and what uh, final uses are more mature and how we can um, make um, out of this an opportunity also for young workers, for uh, researchers, but as I said, also for the industrial community and um, and many other services that can be connected to to this uh, to these uh, new new processes that we are trying to promote. The importance of this world energy transition outlook is its global angle. There is no doubt about that. The scope, the depth, the breadth of this report, Francesco, is quite remarkable. Two questions for you. What is your forecast with regard to the energy mix going forward? How does hydrogen fit in with solar and wind, for example? And on the global, very global angle and not leaving anybody behind, Africa is the world's premium location to harness solar energy. And yet it accounts for 1% of the global total of new renewable energy. Capacity. When you look at the global green recovery, should Africa be a priority for wealthy governments right now? So, uh, excellent question. Naturally, concerning the, the, what we see as a, in terms of technology use in our outlook, we see as the main driver of uh, the, the, the transition the electricity and the energy efficiency. So the electrification of the energy system and more energy efficiency, these are the two main drivers. In terms of pillars of this transformation, we see the key roles of renewables complemented by green, green hydrogen and the sustainable and modern bioenergy. Just to say one thing on this, that uh, this vision of uh, energy future that was based on renewable, centered on renewable, is the vision of Avarina already from, uh, for, from a few years. And it was considered sometimes uh, too progressive, uh, sometimes was considered ideological, sometimes not realistic. But the fact today that uh, this uh, <laughs> dream of a niche, of a, niche, a niche dream has become the mainstream of, uh, of, of today policies. And we see that also the, the most conservative entity now believe that a new energy system is possible based on, uh, on, on renewable. So these are what we see in our outlook. Concerning Africa, I may use the same word that's uh, that Teresa uh, uh, pronounced some, 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 some minutes ago, is a shame. It's a shame that Africa is a huge potential of, uh, of renewable energy. And uh, there has been also this ambiguity concerning Africa. I think just a few months ago, where we can have a, a double track of the world going for a clean energy system based on renewable, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we can have also part of the world where oil and gas could play a role. And this has been delaying the development of a, a clean energy system in Africa. I hope that this ambiguity now is gone. And so that we have to work to create all the conditions for making possible. Because if you want a world that is more inclusive, that is more fair, when we, the use of the word justice is really impractical, so we have to make Africa make the leapfrog into a, 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 a clean energy system because the, the much of the demand in the future will come from Africa and from Southeast Asia. We have to focus and make it possible 
that the change will happen in this region. I was used to say, and on this I conclude on this aspect, that uh, the success of the Paris Agreement will be played in Africa and Southeast Asia. I still believe that this is the key. I think that uh, G7, G20, all we have to work from making the change, accelerate the change in this part of the world to be in line, not only with the Paris Agreement, but also with sustainable development goals. May I say something on this, on your question? Sure, please. I think that, <laughs> thank you, Becky. I think that this is, this is um, quite an interesting question. And I, before starting on hydrogen, I think that the main point, the big shame, is having so many people without access to modern sources of energy when the technology provides also solutions for this. Let's uh, remember that uh, access to energy is key, not only because of the comfort at home or the development of uh, business opportunities, but also for health, for education, for uh, cleaning water and so on. So I think that uh, we need to invest, deeply invest in our grid renewable solutions in Africa. And, and then, uh, of course, there are other opportunities connected to that with a different size industrial um, proportions if we want. But I think that it is very important to ensure the priorities just to start off, to kick off, and then to facilitate a, um, a, a ramp up of, uh, of these opportunities in a sunny continent as um, Africa is. I think that this is part of what IRENA is, um, is promoting and doing. And um, we showed the other day this new plant in Togo that connects very much with this idea. It is a different size, it is an industrial size, but it is so modular, so flexible. We can, we, can, we can play with different options and with different combinations. And I think that uh, we need to be sure collectively, as you say, wealthy countries, of course, being investing in, in, in other countries, but also facilitate the own the domestic investments uh, in these, um, these countries, the ones that are going to benefit there, there's, there's a capacity to do, and I think that there's a great ambition to do, and we need to, to align and to facilitate that this, this can happen as soon as possible. Francesca, what does the race to net zero, as it is being called, mean in terms of geopolitics and relations between states? Climate solutions like solar, wind, electric vehicles depend on rare metals. The result, demand will skyrocket. And your report hints at potentially new challenges in terms of access to rare earth materials. What sort of distribution of power will we see in 2050? So just imagine, Becky, that uh, the 80 percent of uh, the world population is, uh, is counting on fossil fuel for the energy. So moving to uh, a, a cleaner energy system uh, based on renewables will give uh, the possibility for all this part of the world to produce their own energy or any way to, 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 uh, say, to gain in terms of freedom uh, concerning the way they have to import energy. So having this shift, this will change a inevitable the, 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 the relations within the within, uh, within, within country. And this will make, uh, in our assessment, a better world. So there will be the possibility for everyone to enjoy by this geopolitical change that are going to be part or as an effect of the energy transition place. And this is one of the main team of the work of, uh, of, uh, of the agency working on geopolitics. And that we will come in our next general uh, uh, assembly to present to our president of the general assembly one report on ge the geopolitical impact of the use of the green hydrogen. So we are absolutely keen to discuss this. But if I can, Becky, just very shortly come on Africa again and say that uh, we have not only just to invest in making possible the plan to be there. The, it's also important that we work on uh, supporting countries in building the energy industries that will fit with the new energy system. So this can be something that may 
help the economies of this country, can help more jobs to be added into the system, can add the possibility, can uh, support the possibility to go for a more inclusive uh, Africa into the energy system and the world system. Teresa Ribeiro, I'm, I'm interested in your view of the balance of influence and power as we move away from fossil fuel towards a renewable one. China's dominance over global critical mineral supply chains presents one of the largest strategic vulnerabilities to the US and its allies since, and I think I read this in, in, in another report, since the oil embargo, um, which was so damaging back in the 1970s. How do you see the geostrategic balance of power shifting going forward? And should there, one, be concerns? And what might we do to address those concerns? I think that this is a very interesting question. And um, Irena dedicated a, um, a very interesting report a couple of years ago with a very interesting commission working on this, uh, this geopolitical impact of the, of the renewable energy revolution. Um, and as um, you say, it may happen that for the time being, the rare minerals um, are much more under the control or the, 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 the availability of uh, of uh, China than uh, some other classical uh, big powers. But um, the beauty of, uh, of this story uh, is um, slightly different. I think that the beauty is that uh, today anyone can be a champion because there are many different alternatives going onward and there may be many new alternatives to be built. Probably China was the first mover when identifying that they wanted to be a superpower in this new energy market and they invested a lot and probably there are many other options and materials that are being um, handed and promoted in the US or in Europe or in Africa or in Latin America. I think that many different things are happening right now. So it's not an issue of competition for a scare material, but it is um, the, the, the big question mark is how to how to create different alternatives based on resources that um, are closer to our situation, to our, to our geographical position, and, um, and um, able to be reproduced, reused, recircularized uh, in many issues. And the additional question mark in geopolitical terms, I think it is how we can facilitate a smooth transformation of those countries relying so much on the exports of fossil fuel. And of course, we think in the MENA region, but we can also think of Nigeria, of Venezuela, of Brazil, of Mexico. So produce of Colombia producing coal or Indonesia. I think that there are many other countries that uh, may be in a um, vulnerable situation because of the high dependence, the high rates of the GDP connected to fossil fuels. And I think it is very important to anticipate this transformation also in their economies if we want to avoid social tensions on how they can provide services to the communities or how they can provide wealth to their society, to their, to their citizens. And um, I think that these are the, the three main messages. First, to understand where we live and towards we go. So uh, to anticipate where the opportunities may be and how we can build these opportunities. Second, this is much more equal and fair than the previous revolutions, much more depending and reliant on very short um, list of materials. And third, the main question is, we want a peaceful and prosperous world. So we also need to think about those that have been reliant for too long, too much on fossil fuels in a period where we know, we foresee that this is uh, going to decline in the years to come. Be Becky, Becky, <clears throat> I, I, have, I, I, I have not fully responded uh, to your question concerning the, uh, the mineral and rare material. Uh, but, so I, I wish to say just a few words on, on this from our perspective. So we don't believe that mineral and rare earth could be a barrier for the development of the renewables. So this... Uh, we have said this very clearly. So naturally, 
we have to be uh, work and to insist to have uh, a market that is more transparent, that's work more efficiently, that the exploited exploitment of this uh, rare earth and mineral has to happen in a sustainable way, also from the point of view of the security of, uh, of the workers. As uh, Teresa just said, innovation <clears throat> in this field is particularly important. So we are using less and less material, mineral, uh, precious mineral for, for producing uh, the windmills or on batteries. New technologies are coming. Just to give an idea, only 2% of mineral are used in the US for building the, 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 the windmills. So naturally the market, the regulation of the market is, is important, but we don't believe that this argument can be used as a, a introducing a barrier in the development of renewables. And uh, we insist on the fact that uh, working on the, the secular economy is important to reduce the pressure of the economic activities to these uh, to these materials. Francesco La Camera, as the Director General of an agency with 163 members, you have the opportunity to have a unique global perspective. If there were one message that you wanted to highlight from this, your newly published World Energy Transition Outlook, it would be what? Working together. This is the message that uh, I wish this outlook is sending. Working together, we have the chance. We have not much time. We have no time. And we have to work together. And the agency is providing the instrument that has been able to suggest uh, to you. But more important is that outlook is, is just a report. But we are ready to work in all regions, with all countries, to make these dreams or that are in our outlook become reality. This is the strongest message that I want to send. Working together, we want to work with all of you. With that, we're going to leave it there. That was a fascinating discussion. Thank you both. Teresa Ribeiro, the Spanish Vice President and Minister for Ecological Transition, and Francesco La Camera, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency. Thank you both for taking us through some of the measures that it's going to take to save our planet. We must all come together to fight climate change. And that's why it's a constant part of our coverage here at CNN. I'm Becky Anderson here. At CNN in Abu Dhabi, thank you all for joining us. Good day, stay safe, and please stay well. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you.